Trump's legal woes moved to Florida today in his most recent attempt to get his classified documents case dismissed. Judge Aileen Cannon holding a multi-hour hearing. Trump's lawyers arguing that Jack Smith's appointment as special counsel is unconstitutional, claiming that a special counsel must be appointed by law, categorized as a principal officer and subject to Senate confirmation, and contending that the attorney general's ability to appoint a special counsel with the authority of a U.S. attorney is like appointing a, quote, shadow government. Judge Cannon appeared skeptical of this argument, pushing back, saying, quote, is that really a realistic risk when there are well-defined statutes regarding the attorney general's appointment authority? The special counsel's office refuting the defense's arguments, saying it disregards precedent and would have a, quote, pernicious consequence. Smith's office pointing to history and precedent, citing renowned cases that already decided that attorneys general do have the authority to appoint independent special counsels. Experts on both sides questioning why. Why was this motion brought to a hearing in the first place? Take a listen to former Trump attorney Ty Cobb. The independent counsel statute was fully vetted in the Supreme Court and, up, and upheld. The fact she doesn't deny most of these motions without a hearing is silly. Uh, the fact that Trump can get a hearing you know, at, on the flimsiest argument is shocking. This as Judge Cannon continues to face calls to step down from the case. New reporting revealing two Florida judges privately urged her to decline the case when it was assigned to her last year, given Cannon's lack of experience. We know, of course, she refused. Cannon has postponed this trial indefinitely to hash out these pretrial motions. The hearing resumes Monday with Jack Smith's request for Trump's bond conditions to be modified. Joining me now is Renato Mariotti, former federal prosecutor and legal affairs columnist for Politico, and Ankush Kardori former federal prosecutor himself and a senior writer with Politico. Gentlemen, thanks for getting us started. Renata, I'm going to start with you. I mean, I heard the arguments that were coming from Trump's side. And I mean, my question to you straight out of the gate, does that position hold any water? I mean, you had Emil Bovey saying that Jack Smith does not have, quote, sufficient oversight on his decision making. But you and I both know that if there was any more court quote, coordination between Jack Smith and Attorney General Merrick Garland, that Trump's position would be there's too much oversight over Jack Smith. Yeah, I actually think that there, uh, Trump team maybe have been, would have, was actually trying to put the special counsel into a box. Essentially, no matter what they answered, it's one of those questions like, you know, how, how do I look in this dress or how do I compare it to my friends where you, you, don't, you don't know how to answer no matter what the answer is going to be. It, you're you're going to potentially lose. I, I think as a practical matter, this the hearing was over before it was uh, started. You know, as a practical matter, eight different judges had already decided this question. They all sided with the special counsel regulations, saying that they were lawful. And and as the special counsel, uh, it, you know, argued and made that made that point clear. It, you even Judge Cannon, who is uh, very uh, inclined towards Trump really was calling into question the arguments that Trump's team made. I think the question here is really the process. Why was there a hearing? Why hasn't a trial date been set? Really, the timing and the process is the issue here, not the, uh, the result, which is almost certainly going to be a denial of Trump's motion. Yeah, but you know, Ankush, past is not prologue with somebody like Judge Cannon. We've seen her ignore precedent and make rulings that actually caused the 11th Circuit to come back and tell her that she was wrong. Your colleagues at Politico have written that Trump's claim is, quote, a far-fetched bid because num numerous courts have rejected nearly identical constitutional challenges to other special counsels. Renato just making reference to the fact that on eight prior occasions, this particular challenge has been shut down in other jurisdictions. But why is Judge Cannon entertaining this? Ankush, this wasn't like a 30-minute hearing where you walk in, it's motion calendar, right, we're done, right? Hours later, we have her entering an order that allows prior to June 24th, both sides to file separate notices of supplemental authority not to exceed five double-spaced pages. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's an, a real mystery why she felt like she needed to hold a hearing for this particular issue. I mean, it is the first in a multi-day set of hearings. Um, I think an optimistic way of, of looking at this is that she is actually trying to be responsive to some of the criticism she's received and actually trying to now move through these issues. Um, one way to try to move through them, if you're some, a, a judge who's somewhat inexperienced, maybe not totally uh, confident about your 
mastery of the issues is to bring in uh, lawyers, hold oral, oral arguments, ask us some questions. Um, I agree with Renato that the result here should be um, uh, uh, that this particular argument is rejected. Um, but I also agree with you. I mean, we can't be certain in this area. I mean, I would have said the same thing about Trump's bid for a special master. Um, and of course, she resolved that. Uh, in Trump's favor in a very, very unprecedented precedented fashion as well. Um, so we'll see uh, at the end of the day what she chooses to do with this. Renato, special counsel Jack Smith's office warning Judge Cannon of, quote, pernicious consequences if the defense's theory is adopted. Let's kind of walk through. Let's game this out a little bit, right? Let's walk through what happens. If Judge Cannon agrees with Donald Trump and grants the motion to dismiss on the basis of an unconstitutional appointment of Jack Smith, what are the next steps? Well, it's certainly going to go up on appeal. Uh, you know, as Ankash uh, alluded to a moment ago, uh, this is not the first time uh, that Judge Cannon has, you know, been faced with an issue. And previous, where previously, I will say, that, you know, as he pointed out, she, she came on the wrong side of that issue, issued an unprecedented ruling. Ultimately, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and really a smackdown, uh, reversed that decision that she made. So that's one uh, consequence there. But, you know, another consequence is, you know, this is not the only special counsel we've had. Uh, in fact, there's another special counsel right now uh, who's litigating cases against a, another uh, individual, uh, Hunter Biden. And so this is an argument that could be made in other, in other contexts by others. And essentially the point being made here to the judge is this ruling that you have is going to have potentially broader consequences uh, let's not do something foolish, uh, but focus entirely on this single case. Renata, you mentioned a few minutes ago about the possibility that the lack of experience on the on behalf of Aileen Cannon may be dictating the fact that we had a multi-hour hearing today. The New York Times reporting that Judge Cannon was approached by two of her colleagues on the federal bench, one of whom I would note is allegedly the chief judge, Cecilia Antonaga, for the Southern District of Florida, both of them telling her, you know what, you should probably not take this assignment. It was a blind file for those of you that are questioning this. It was a blind filing, meaning it was randomly assigned to Judge Cannon. And yet we've seen things like this that make you more than a little bit suspicious, I would say, Ankush. For example, the magistrate judges in any federal court are the ones that handle some of the more mundane hearings on some of the more discovery issues, if not most of the pretrial motions. And then the district court judge, him or herself, actually does the trial proper. In this instance, Bruce Reinhardt, who's the magistrate judge assigned to Judge Cannon, who's the one who signed the search warrants for Mar-a-Lago, she hasn't let Reinhardt touch any of these pretrial motions, which moved things along, right, Ankush? And so what's going on here with the fact that she had other people, including a chief judge, telling her you might not want to take this case? Well, look, she seems to uh, want to hold on to this and want to hold on to uh, uh, control sort of the resolution of all of the issues. I think it would have been better for uh, uh, the country, everyone except Trump, essentially, if she had taken that advice um, and passed on the case. Um, but. You know that's uh, uh, you know that's a, that was a very serious ask of her. I'm sure that you know she somewhat bristled um, at the notion. Um, it would have been also better for her, as you suggested, to delegate some of this to a magistrate. In fact, there are quite yeah. fact-intensive discovery issues that are currently being litigated in front of her. And as you and Renato know, those sort of fact-intensive discovery issues tend to be the ones that are perfectly uh, ripe for magistrates to handle because they have the time, the expertise to dig into those and provide recommendations to the district judge. So it would have been better for her to take advantage of that uh, op option as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I can't, you know, sort of put myself into her mind. The best I can draw from this is that she feels like she needs to retain ownership of the case in its entirety.